Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. For, I think I have a good lunch. Um, we'll uh, keep you keep you awake. I think for the last session. And um, I want what I want to do now is just to talk to you a little bit about some of the themes that you've already heard about, um, particularly today. Uh, thinking about uh, unwanted immune responses to biotherapeutics. And so I'm going to be talking to you about integrating different approaches to managing immunogenicity risk and also, um, excitingly, talking about a new technology which we launched just a couple of months ago called Mutamap, which I think will be interesting to quite a number of you. So um, the introductory slides don't... I'm not going to spend much time on them because you've already heard uh, quite a bit already from uh, some of the previous speakers, uh, particularly um, Isabel as well mentioned it. So as we know, new biological drugs... Um, particularly antibody therapeutics, but also pretty much any kind of molecule uh, that's proteinaceous uh, in, in content, can actually contain immunologically novel sequences, which essentially the immune system can respond against. And um, in a context of biotherapeutics, unwanted immunogenicity can result in that treatment failure through the production of neutralizing antibodies. Um, and we also heard that there is a number of different uh, factors that can contribute to that, and there's not a single um, element which really uh, is um, the main driver of those kinds of responses. So you can typically classify them as both extrinsic and intrinsic factors um, that are listed there, and, and all of those actually have a very important role to play. Um, and it's really important, and I can't stress it enough, that thinking about um, immunogenicity from the very earliest time points of, of the development process is really, really important. And that's because when we think about different biotherapeutics that are reaching the market, a lot of them actually are against the same kind of targets. And although the, um, uh, the structure of those molecules might be a little bit different, obviously in regards to the actual sequence of the protein, but also the, um, uh, the, the, the type of scaffold that it might be, ultimately um, it's, it's quite a competitive environment. And so to reach the clinic with as low as um, immunogenicity risk as possible is really, really very important. Um, so why do people kind of want to think about these things apart from that obvious end, end point and result? But they want to think about um, uh, lead selection. So you want to talk, try and choose the most appropriate candidate to take forwards. And um, I'm going to be talking about that. You also might want to understand the immune response to the therapeutic once it's already been delivered. So actually just trying to understand what the current state of play is. And all of this together can actually support your regulatory position, which is very important when you're submitting data to the regulators. Now, I think it's always very dangerous to put any kind of immunology in, or actually any kind of scientific process into a, into a graph like this or a schematic, but in simple terms, it's what we're trying to point out here is that your, your molecule, your biologic of interest, can be taken up by cells of the immune system, particularly antigen-presenting cells. And these proteins can then be processed and presented in the context of MHC class 2. And peptides derived from the therapeutic um, in the context of class 2 then interact with T-cell receptors on the surface of CD4 uh, helper T-cells. And there's this cognate interaction with the appropriate co-stimulation, which drives proliferation, cytokine production from the CD4s, which can then provide help to the um, naive B cells to then drive a memory B cell phenotype, um, which in turn then generates these anti-drug antibodies, or ADA, that we also heard earlier today. And these antibodies can have just binding effect, but they can also neutralize. And it's these effects which can be quite catastrophic, not only regarding loss of efficacy of your um, drug, but also altering the pharmacokinetics and dynamics, and potentially, in quite a number of cases, actually some very extreme cross-reactive situations as well. So we want to mitigate all of those risks. And at ProImmune, we're really experts in a number of these different tools. I'm not going to go through all of these in a huge amount of detail, but some of them I, I am. A lot of the, the tools that I'm going to be talking about use um, a, a biobank, and we use healthy donors, which are sourced from the UK population. We HLA type all the donors, and that's great because it gives us a very broad um, characterization with, with, with regards to HLA type. So we can actually select donors that have a broad global distribution of different MHC types. But we can also specifically select donors of particular HLA phenotypes. So we've heard um, instances where there might be a particular interest in an HLA type. Maybe it's associated with that disease, um, if you're talking about autoimmunity, for example. And so we can actually craft those donors to, to focus on that particular MHC type where that's possible. Yeah. So um, ProPresent, you've heard <coughs> a bit of data from Margot yesterday and also other people have alluded to it. So I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail. This is an antigen presentation assay which uses tandem mass spectrometry to uh, um, sequence the peptides that have been presented by the MHC class 2 molecule. Um, not only class 2, but we also have tools to look at class 1, which is what Margot was presenting yesterday. 
Um, this is a great tool because it really allows you to look at the really clear details of how the immune response is actually being initiated and exactly which elements of an antigen are being presented by the immune response to, to, to be initiating it. So you can actually use it to look at quite a lot of questions. It, 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 I don't want to sort of limit it just to thinking about antibody drugs. Um, it allows you to address the, the potential of the drug mode of action. It can allow you to look at the impact of protein modifications. So if you're, not, if you're looking at a number of different variants, you can actually see what point mutations, how that can actually impact on antigen pre presentation, so antigen processing, and then subsequent binding to class two in presentation. Um, you can actually use it for target identification. So we were hearing from Fiona earlier about um, uh, commensal bacteria. Um, actually, you know, this technology is great for being able to actually identify peptides that are being presented from a very wide range of antigens. And uh, I'll explain how that's done too. It's a really rapid technology. It allows us to look at these kinds of questions in just a number of weeks. And we have a, a, a publication record which is unrivaled, looking at a number of different types of molecule classes. Um, and I'm going to be taking you through some of these case studies uh, shortly. So the principle of the assay as introduced by Marga yesterday is actually very simple. What we do is we take monocyte-derived dendritic cells. And these immature dendritic cells are really hungry. They love taking up antigen of any kind. Peanut butter. I mean, literally anything you like, you can load into these dendritic cells. Um, so you can use recombinant proteins, highly purified proteins. You can use mixtures of proteins. It doesn't have to be a single molecule. And at this point, um, at the loading stage, the dendritic cells take up the antigen, we then mature the DCs, and at that point they actually stop taking up the antigen and they start processing the, the proteins. And the proteins are chopped up into um, sequences through the uh, um, uh, enzymatic cleavage inside the cell and loaded onto the context of MHC class 2 through the usual processing pathway. Um, these MHC peptide complexes on the surface of dendritic cells, um, we then immunoprecipitate, so we pull them down using antibodies against HLA-DR, DP, or DQ, depending on the questions you want. This can be done sequentially, so we can actually look at just DR, we can look at DR and DPQ, we can look at all three, it's up to you. Um, we then isolate the peptides from the groove of the MHC molecule, and then sequence this using tandem mass spec. QC is really important, as you can imagine, it's, it's quite a complex process, and the beauty of ProPresent is how we've managed to marry um, the latest advances in, obviously, our understanding of immunology, but also with a really rapid development of um, highly sensitive mass spec instruments. So in the past, sort of 20 years ago, when I first started out, this was something which people were just beginning to do, and it was really, really difficult. And you saw a picture in the previous talk about the a, a needle in a haystack. I mean, that's literally what it was. And people spending their whole PhDs trying to get a single peptide out of these kinds of assays. Well, now it's very routine, um, but routine in a way that does mean you have to be very careful with the, how you analyze the data. So what we do is we actually generate um, a database, which is the whole human proteome. And on top of that, we add in your protein sequence of interest. So whether that's an antibody sequence, whether that's a bacterial proteome, whether that's a toxin, whether it's an enzyme, whatever it might be, we will add that in to, to generate a database, which is the whole human proteome plus that sequence. And what we do in the assay is we report all the peptides from your proteins of interest. So we're not reporting the whole spectrum of peptide presentation. That literally goes into the hundreds of thousands of peptides. We are actually reporting all the peptides from your protein or proteins of interest. Um, we perform very uh, stringent statistical characterization. So um, all the peptides identified um, are given an expect value, uh, which is a bit like a p-value, but that's probably a little bit misleading. Um, so we have a 95% confidence-based exclusion search, and we also have a decoy database. So all the peptides, the um, human protein sequence is scrambled, and we also search against that scrambled database to ensure we have a less than 1% false discovery rate, which is um, sort of mass spec standard approach. The peptides that we identify um, have what you would expect to see from MHC class 2, which is a sort of typical average length of 15 amino acids, plus or minus a few. And um, one of the really important things is that we actually look for endogenous proteins. So we're looking for peptides that are being presented from housekeeping proteins. Um, when we do this, we actually work with a whole panel of donors. We don't just look at one donor. If you did, you would get a pretty skewed understanding. We typically work with a panel of at least 10 donors in these kinds of studies with a range of different HLA restrictions. And if a donor doesn't present our housekeeping protein peptides, then that donor is excluded from analysis. So for example, if you did a 10 donor study, uh, we would always run 12 donors, and you typically get 12 donors reported, but it's a guaranteed minimum of 10. Um, so the kinds of data you get, I mean, this is looking actually at an antibody molecule, adalimumab. Um, 
Here we have the donor uh, identifications down the left-hand side. Um, here we have the HLA restrictions, uh, uh, looking at DR. In this case, it's a DR-restricted project. And the individual sequences are listed here. Uh, the expect value is shown here. So if it's less than 0.05, that's indicative of peptide identity. And if it's between 0.05 and 0.3, that's indicative of peptide homology. What you'll typically see is these overlapping sequences, which is what you would normally expect for MHC class 2 presentation. So rather than seeing just unique sequences, they typically come in clusters. And these clusters are um, very interesting, and I think certainly over time we've seen, um, we've gained a lot of experience in a whole wide range of different types of molecule and know what to expect. Now, um, to give you an idea of what you might expect from an antibody molecule, um, in total, we actually identified four separate regions here from adalimumab. And what you can see is that um, these are all actually from the, the different CDR uh, regions of the antibody, is that um, some peptide sequences, such as this one in blue, is, is highly promiscuous. So we actually see peptide, significant peptide fragments from all the donors that we characterized, whereas there are some other sequences which are only coming up in one or two donors. So you can sometimes see peptides that are highly promiscuous and come up in all the donors, um, and then you see other peptides which are just maybe kind of come up in one or two donors. Um, this particular peptide is of, of interest. It actually comes up quite a lot. Some have determined it as a um, sort of a more of like a regulatory phenotype um, peptide, but it's actually a framework sequence which comes up um, uh, very, very commonly. At least variants of this peptide come up very commonly when we characterize um, antibody molecules. Um, but when we do these kinds of projects across the board, you'll sometimes see sequences which are absolutely just unique to your, your therapeutic. Um, and of course, if you're looking at um, different kinds of questions, whether that's a, a, a bacterial um, genome or, or whatever the question might be, um, the number of regions that you're identifying tends to correlate with the size of the protein. So an antibody molecule, 150 kD, you'll probably see four or 10 regions, between four and 10 regions coming up. If you're looking at a molecule which is much, much larger, you'll see significantly more peptide sequences coming up. I want to take you through um, how this kind of technology has been very useful. Um, some of you will, will know and some of you won't, but this is a, a story that was um, published quite recently um, by a combination of the FDA and Nova Nordisk, looking at uh, the Treptocog Alpha, which is an engineered Factor 7A uh, analog. Now, native Factor 7A has been used for a very long time with no problems in regards to clinical immunogenicity. But um, Novo wanted to, to modify it, sequence modify it, to increase its enzymatic activity to make it more, more fast acting. And to do this, they introduced three point mutations, um, substitutions in the sequence compared to the original native uh, molecule. However, when it got to the clinical trial, it was very unfortunate because bleeding episodes were, um, were, were identified. Um, and they were, these were effectively treated, but, uh, and this is the big but, um, anti-drug antibody inhibitors were observed in some patients. And so at that stage, because obviously compared to the, the state of play with the original molecule, uh, drug development process was halted. And the, the key question the company was asked, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Clearly what's happened is that we've actually introduced neo-epitopes, novel epitope sequences have been introduced through this engineering process, which has been unintended. So this data here um, was published in Science Translational Medicine in 2017. And what we can look at here is a parallel study carried out internally at Novo and um, outsourced to ProImmune using um, basically this MAPS assay, ProPresent assay. So we call ours ProPresent, we do it in our method. It was completely independently done at Novo as well. And essentially we're comparing the, uh, the native Factor 7A to the Treptocog Alpha. And the donors weren't the same donors. They were, everything was done very, very independently. And what you can see is that there's, these are three substitution points here. So the, the valine to, to D and E to V and M to Q, these different positions. The final two C-terminal mutations are very close together, just two amino acids apart. Um, and what you see is that these, these bars essentially indicate the antigen presentation that was identified from factor 7A. So you can see that it's actually these point mutations which are highly presented in the Vitreptocog alpha molecule when you look at the donors. And when you compare the two studies, um, Novo and ProImmune, essentially the numbers of donors are you know, reasonably similar, the peptide lengths identified are similar, the core sequences were the same, um, the amino acid <laughs> positions of course are the same as well, and, and the cluster length. So it, the, the data is absolutely reproducible in these two studies using completely independent donors. But 
You have to remember that in antigen presentation, just because a peptide is presented, it doesn't mean to say that there's actually a problem. Just because a peptide is presented doesn't mean to say there's a cognate T-cell response, and it's really important to follow that up with additional information. So what uh, Novo then did was a, a 50 donor T-cell proliferation assay using the peptides that they, uh, from the overlapping sequences from those particular regions. And what they can see here is that when you compare the wild type to the mutant sequence, the, this n terminal mutation, there was no differences between the, the two um, sequences. But at these um, positions 296 and 298, you can see that the mutation ver mutated version, the way that the amino acid was changed, really led to a, a, an increase in the T-cell proliferation in these healthy donor panels. And this last bar is actually a combination of those, of those two peptides. So not only do they know that this peptide is presented, but also it's known to drive a significant T-cell response. Now, I would commend the paper to you because I've not done it justice. There's a lot of really interesting data in there, not only talking about those techniques, but also things like physical MHC peptide binding assays to get to the root of the HLA restriction. But essentially, the conclusion of the paper is that immunogenicity was the root cause failure. Um, and out of those three mutations, it happened to be that two out of three of them ended up um, causing uh, unwanted immunogenicity because they were being presented by HLA-DR. So this wasn't picked up in the early stage phase one, two trials. So you can't rely on those early stage trials to answer that question. If, if these sorts of studies had been carried out before, then the risk really would have been mitigated. And I think this is a good example of how those sorts of, these sorts of assays can be applied. Now that's just thinking about HLA-DR. What about other um, loci as well? DR is just one of, um, well, there's also DR and there's DP and there's DQ for MHC class two presentation. And I want to just highlight here some data um, that was um, published last year by um, CSL Bearing, Marco Hoffman, who's in the audience somewhere, um, is, is responsible for this particular study. Um, and this is a very interesting story, and I'd probably ask you to have a chat with him to, to explain it far better than I can. But in, in, in very brief summary, again, not doing it justice, the key to this data is looking at um, the three different colours. So DR in blue, DP in sort of orange, and then DQ in red. And what you can see here is a comparison of full length factor eight. So this is a recombinant protein here. The middle bar is Afstila, which is a CSL molecule, which is actually truncated in this middle domain here, the B domain. And then this is plasma derived factor eight at the bottom panel. So plasma derived factor eight essentially is the full length protein. But what you can see is that there's a dramatic decrease in antigen presentation when you look at plasma derived factor eight, comparing that to the full length recombinant protein. Now, what the reasons are for that are probably very complex um, and probably to do with uh, the, the purification of um, the recombinant protein. But also you have to bear in mind that the plasma derived factor eight is a very heterogeneous mixture of, 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 of proteins. Um, if you look at um, the, it's been isolated from multiple donors that have all these different mutations and factor eight is such a large protein with all these different mutations that it's, uh, it's quite a big, big, big interest. But what you can clearly see is that the Afstila product has much less, uh, a much reduced um, antigen presentation profile compared to um, um, plasma derived factor eight, but also the spe specifically the full length recombinant factor eight as well. So these tools are really helpful to understand what that antigen presentation profile looks like. <coughs> so the T cell proliferation assays that I mentioned earlier, um, we also perform these very regularly. Um, it allows you to identify the functional relevance of individual epitopes using panels of naive donors. We deploy a flow cytometry based assay, which is great because it's very, very sensitive. Um, it allows us to actually combine this with looking at additional T cell phenotypes if required. So it's not just about um, proliferation, but also if you wanted to, you can obviously, well, we, we confirm it's the CD4 T cells that are proliferating, but we can also um, add on additional markers if needed. Essentially, it's a seven day protocol where we incubate peptides um, of interest with the um, uh, naive T cells, which are labeled with CFSE, which is an intracellular dye. Um, the cells then proliferate um, upon activation. And at that point, the dye then gets diluted equally between the daughter cells. And you can then measure this in flow cytometry, comparing an unstimulated control here to the test peptide here, which is actually inducing a strong T cell response. So as the cells move from this upper right quadrant to the upper left quadrant, this is where it's indicating proliferation. And so this is just measuring CFSC on the x-axis and, and CD4 cells on the uh, y-axis. And you can do this, uh, use this technology to, uh, to map um, 
essentially exactly where the uh, T cell responses are coming from. And what we've marked here is the percentage of antigenicity, so the number of donors that are significantly responding to this individual peptide. These are overlapping peptides from adalimumab along the bottom, and the coloured bars, each one is a different donor that's responding significantly. So you can see these hot spots. What if you're not interested in the individual peptides? Maybe you just want to take a step back and you want to think about the comparison of different, um, uh, different uh, antibody leads or different um, therapeutic leads. Well, this is where the dendritic cell um, whole protein comparison assay comes in handy. And in this instance, we're also using CFSE assays, but we take immature dendritic cells, we load it with your antigen, and then we do a co-incubation with autologous PBMCs. So PBMCs that are labelled from the same donor, and then we measure proliferation after seven days. Um, it's a great tool for being able to compare um, individual leads, and you get a response index output, which is the percentage of donors responding, but it also takes into account the strength of that response, which is important because the, um, the dendritic cells are obviously very potent stimulators, and so you get a, a very wide dynamic range of the assay. And this is a publication from uh, a shark VNAR domain that was published by Elasmogen last year, looking at the comparison of their, their um, candidates. Okay, so um, the last part of the talk, I want to focus on this new technology called Mutamap. Bit of a switch, switch in gear, because we're not talking about, directly talking about immunogenicity characterization, but what this tool is really appropriate for is when you get to the point of your final design choices in your um, therapeutic, there are a number of different situations where you really think, actually, what if I tweaked this amino acid sequence here, maybe tweak that amino acid sequence there to not only improve affinity and improve the character characteristics of the antibody from a perspective of binding to the target, but also other developability uh, challenges. That could be expression, it could be immunogenicity. Um, but the problem of doing that, if you've got a whole antibody, is where do you start? Because then, of course, there are potentially 19 other amino acids that you might want to introduce at every particular position, and it soon gets a little bit out of hand. So how do you go about doing this? Well, Mutamap is a, is a great tool which um, allows you to, in a high-throughput way, um, characterise what the impact of these point mutations is on a point-by-point -point basis, position by position. So we can explore the effect of substituting each amino acid at each position in a protein sequence, one by one, looking at all 19 possible substitutions if you wanted to. Now, if you're looking at a typical um, sort of CDR domain, that could be uh, sort of 2,000 mutations. Um, so that's a, so a 19 amino acid substitutions and 100 amino acids. And that can just, we can do this and deliver it to you in just 12 weeks. The way it works is that we take um, the parental sequence and then through a process of site-directed mutagenesis, we then generate all the different mutations. And then we express these following um, confirmation that the S, um, SDM has actually been performed correctly. We then perform in vitro translation to actually express at small levels, small quantities, which is all required, um, the protein um, um, mutation of interest. And then, rather than using SPR, um, BACOR or surface plasma resonance, we're actually using a high throughput solution equilibrium titration assay called SET, which is a really great tool. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. It's not a new technology, it's one that's really been probably under underutilized in the past and has a lot of advantages. And then from that, we can then identify the optimized protein variants to take forward. So to introduce the solution equilibrium titration assay, if you can imagine uh, a, a, a beer core approach, um, it's a great tool for being able to characterize, obviously, very um, uh, to, to a high degree of detail, the, the affinity of interaction between antibody and antigen, or any two interactions. But when you have a really high affinity interaction, such as you typically do with a monoclonal antibody, then the off rate is a bit of a challenge because actually if you need to then measure an off rate, you actually have to be waiting an awful long time to get that, that data through. Whereas the solution um, equilibrium titration assay actually performs that the, the higher the affinity, the better it performs. So it's really well suited for um, these kinds of interactions. And just to give you an explanation, I'm gonna show you a comparison here between Avastin and Lucentis, which is a, a variant of, of Avastin with just a few uh, point mutations in it. And what you can see here is that just in a few points um, of data, we can actually generate very, very tight fit curves to determine the affinity of binding with very, very tight uh, confidence intervals. It's a, a highly robust approach um, and allows us to, in a high throughput way, measure exactly what's going on with all the mutations that we're, we're generating.
So to explain this, we're actually going to show you some data taking the parental molecule of Avastin. So Avastin, um, uh, a mutamap is generated uh, for Avastin. The sequences of the parental sequence are shown down here. So we've got CDRH1 and CDRH3 listed on the um, vertical axis. And all the in individual amino acid variants are shown along the top. Now this heat map, I'm going to explain the color coding to you. Essentially green is good, <laughs> obviously. Uh, it basically means you're increasing the affinity of binding greater than threefold comparing to the, compared to the parental sequence. So you've got much increased binding. Yellow is within the threefold difference of the wild type, so it's not really making any difference. Orange is uh, worse than threefold compared to the wild type. And then red is significantly, basically no binding, or the protein wasn't able to be expressed, which is actually also a very useful piece of information, particularly when you're looking at multiple variants and you want to know if there's going to be an impact in uh, downstream production of your antibody. So to point out here some, some sort of key examples, uh, for example, if we look um, uh, at... Yes, so... Um, for example, here we've got a, a histidine in this position here. You can see that there's actually uh, a beneficial mutation here um, at, at this position. Um, but actually, what's really helpful is if you look vertically down, down, the, down the slide, you can actually see particular positions which are really not very um, happy where modifications can occur. These, these are not really permissive zones that you can actually introduce any mutations. And actually, if you look at this tryptophan here, you can see that the only permissive um, uh, modification actually is a tryptophan. So it just basically shows that any change from that original sequence is, is not going to help at all. And there are other such zones in, in the area. Um, so with this information, it allows you to glance to, to take forward particular beneficial sequences, beneficial amino acids, um, into development. So if we look at this particular serine residue here, 105, I'm going to show you a little bit more detailed data. So um, rather than just the, just the heat map, I want to show you the differences. So this is the wild type um, <coughs> affinity. The improved affinity is shown here in green. Um, and then actually all of these neutral affinities, there's a, there's a bit of a wide curve. Um, and then here we've got the reduced affinities um, below threefold. Um, actually, what's interesting is that when you look at this, it's actually the second most, second highest uh, mutation is actually the muta one of the mutations in Lucentis. So this is actually what the developer took forward um, it was one of the mutations in Lucentis, but actually there is a, another amino acid which is beneficial in that particular position. So this technology has a huge number of benefits, as I'm sure you can appreciate, particularly speed, um, but it's really understanding which point mutations are, are not just beneficial, but also permissive. Because it may be that certain positions, of course, this can't be changed from the point of view of binding or from the point of view, it could be any of the developability question. But if you can even know which mutations you can actually introduce and keep without there being a problem downstream for binding to the target, that's actually a huge benefit. And this technology can also be taken on to then combine multiple mutations downstream as sort of subsequent characterizations. So it allows you to make very informed protein engineering decisions, typically at these sort of late sorts of stages of development. It can obviously improve your activity and affinity by cherry picking the mutations of interest. You can actually use it to de-immunize. So um, tying this in with a previous set of um, assay types I've been explaining to you with ProPresent with the T cell assays, you can actually see um, if there is a particular challenge with regards to unwanted immune responses, then you can use this data to say, actually, yeah, that particular amino acid mutation would be okay to use. Um, it may be that in the preclinical development, you need to alter cross-reactivity. You might want to improve cross-species reactivity to the target to, to, to do those preclinical studies. Um, and that's another great use of this technology. Um, stability and manufacturability is really, really important. If you can't make your drug, then that's no good. And again, it gives you extra options. It gives you choices to, in knowing which ones to take forward. Of course, you can prolong your half-life and um, clearly develop unique IP as well in the whole situation. So this is groundbreaking because it allows us to, to deliver these kinds of projects very, very quickly in just 12 weeks. So this is actually one of the slides that I, I started yesterday with, um, just to sort of summarise a little bit of what we're doing. So we've talked um, here about protein design, we've talked about antigen processing, we've talked about T-cell function, um, and all of these assays that we, we have kind of tie into that.
Um, you've heard from Margot yesterday about the MHC peptide binding assays for MHC class 1 and class 2. We've talked about LSPOT and characterizing T cell responses there. And we've also talked about um, the, uh, where is it gone? Here we are, the um, MHC multimers, so class 1 pentamers and class 2 tetramers. What we haven't had a chance to talk about, um, just in the interest of time, are things like the cytokine release assay, which is, is a whole blood tool for characterizing more innate uh, and rapid immune responses in, in whole blood assays. So again, if you're interested in discussing that, then, then do let us know. But in summary, um, managing drug immunogenicity by design is really, really important um, to win your drug market. Generating this kind of key data puts you ahead of your competitors. Um, and to do that, you know, you, you can't be expected to do, be experts in everything. And we are experts in the things that we do. And I think partnering with us allows us to address those key questions in a very timely way for you and a cost-effective way. So our breadth of experience and being able to integrate these different technologies and tools we um, aim to reduce your program risks. And over time, we have a huge range of different experiences with different drug types, different molecule types. And I think that plays into that, uh, that general <coughs> breadth of understanding. So again, thank you for your attention. And I have no excuse for going over time, which I just did. So sorry about that. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Thank you.